Good morning. Good morning. So, as you know, these previous weeks we've been going pretty fast. We're doing a lot. Um, and it's an overview. We're not like diving into scripture and studying chapters or even necessarily very much of a discussion on individual verses. And that will be true somewhat today as well. We're covering three books. Last week, Rich did six books of the Bible in 40 minutes. <laughs> Um, so this is a leisurely pace today. Um, and they all have, they're all based on poetry. Uh, there are three books. Which are part of the wisdom literature. Um, and there's a fourth book that we'll be doing in a couple of weeks. Which is also poetry. The, the, all four of these are poetry. The first one is not considered part of the, the wisdom books. Um, so we'll be doing these three today, and I just want to set up a little bit before we start, um, do a little bit of context. We've said some of these things before. Um, thinking about surveys, if you survey some land, whether it's the promised land, you're checking it out on the hilltop, or Wisconsin farmland, you basically try to get some kind of a vantage point where you can see it, right? You don't do that from the valley. You might want to go to the valley to see what it's like in the valley, but you try to get a higher elevation and it's different than when you're actually working in the soil. If you buy that land and you like cultivate it and you live there, that's a very different experience. So surveying scripture, it's a helpful exercise. We're doing that this fall. We're doing that in the New Testament in the spring. Um, and it's not a substitute for actually diving into the scripture and studying. And so we're counting on and expecting and hoping that you will do that in your days and weeks in between these faith cafes when, when we do the, the survey kind of stuff. And we really need both in our lives. We need the high level things. It's helpful to see the narrative and the thread and the history of what happens in the Old Testament, how it leads into the New Testament. Um, but we also need to get down into the dirt with Scripture. So another thing, um, Christian Scripture isn't like the Quran. It, where Muslims believe that the Quran is written in heaven in Arabic and it was transcribed to Muhammad and we have word for word what exists. Um, we don't believe that about the Christian scriptures. We believe that God inspired and spoke through people. Um, people saw glimpses of God. They had visions sometimes. They tell stories. They sing songs. Recounting traditions. Writing poetry. Writing about wisdom, which we're talking about today sometimes prophetic charges. They're written by, scripture is written by imperfect people using finite language. Um, any of you that have tried to communicate something carefully and later thought, that wasn't exactly how I wanted to say that or that was misunderstood, it's very finite language. And it's rooted in the culture of the day. So none of, none of this is new, I just wanted to remind us as we're thinking about all of these parts of scripture in the Old Testament and as we move into the New Testament in the spring. Um, it's rooted in the culture of the day and it's just as imperfect as our own culture today. 
So Old Testament culture, if you want to do a really, really broad brush, pretty paternalistic. Not that we're not today in many of our cultures and countries. Um, agrarian, nomadic. So that's something that living in Madison. How many of you come from farming background? So two or three. So most of us don't. So we can't directly relate to some of the metaphors and language that's used in the Old Testament. So what we have to do is try to dig and look at what are the principles that are being taught using that language that's from a lifestyle and a, an era that's very different than ours. And how can, what can we learn from that? So it's often polygamous, a survivalist kind of experience for a lot of people, hand to mouth, um, no refrigerators, that kind of thing. Pretty violent, not that our day is not violent um, in many, many ways, but it's different. Um, many forms of gods, tangible gods, idols, different kinds of earthly power centers, many more kingdoms than we have today. <clears throat> So it gets written, and to some degree it reflects its cultural context. Not all of that is stuff that reflects the character of God. And so it's, it's hard work for us sometimes to read that and not just take it word for word and say, apply this in the 21st century as is. Um, sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't do that. Um, and actually an example is, is Song of Songs, which we'll get into today. Um, it uses a lot of metaphor to describe how beautiful a woman is or a man is that we wouldn't use today or we wouldn't understand. We wouldn't talk about pomegranates or we wouldn't talk about goats, that someone is like a goat, right? So we're, we live in a different era and if Song of Songs was written today, it would be a very different kind of language. Um, there's a great part of the video, we're actually going to look at three videos today, but there's a great portion of that that you see. So one more thing. Um, there does not seem to be evidence from scripture. This is just another example of what I'm talking about. I don't think there's evidence in scripture that God is male. Jesus was male. Jesus was a human being. I don't think there's evidence that God is male. But there are lots and lots of pronouns that are used when either the language of the day needed to use a pronoun and our language needs to use a pronoun and instead of saying they, we say he or she. Um, and so that idea gets reinforced when it's not necessarily an eternal quality of truth about God. So the burden, there's a lot of burden on us to sift through that. Um, I think maybe in 100 or 200 years or 50 years, there will be um, translations of the Bible that there have been attempts to do that, but that try to move beyond that um, unnecessarily. So we don't think God is male and therefore is more reflected somehow in the, in the character of human beings that are made as males. And when it gets passed on through generations, and if we pass that to the next generation and they pass that on, um, then we're passing along that extra work that needs to be done, or we're passing along that perspective that might not be complete. So we can only understand and apply scripture in the context of all of the rest of God's word. And remember, that does include written scripture, but it includes the way the Holy Spirit speaks. It includes the created world around us, the scripture that teaches us that. That's part of what God has said, and God is still speaking through that. Jesus, Jesus is the Word, and Jesus is the image of God. We're made in the image of God. And then God's Word in other ways, revelation and insight, which continues today. So taken all together, these things point us to God, they still do, but they're not static. They're not, there is a back cover on the Bible, but there's not a back cover on all of the other ways that God is continuing to speak. So just remember that as we go into these next few weeks, as we go into the New Testament, that those are some parameters that we need to follow. And sometimes it's helpful to see that in Scripture, we can't take any one part of scripture and just read it on its own and say that is completely sort of um, stands on its own and, and we can understand everything about that characteristic of God or God's expectations of us without looking at the rest of scripture. So the old covenant doesn't make as much sense before we have the new covenant and vice versa. You know, if you lived during the old covenant times, you would think this is it. This is the way life is. This is what God expects of me. This is the promise that God has made and the promise that we have made or Abraham made. Um, and it sheds new light when you see the new covenant. 
or the difference between judgment, which is a real thing, and grace. Grace doesn't exist apart from judgment. Judgment doesn't exist apart from grace. So when we want to understand these complicated concepts, we have to look at the parts of scripture that are meant and um, have both parts of that conversation. Sacrifice and mercy. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that we're looking at today both have, Proverbs is much more rigid, do these things, and sometimes it says, do these things and you'll have a long life. Well, that may or may not be true, but Ecclesiastes is like, you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> so they balance each other out, and neither one on its own is the only way to understand wisdom and understand God better. <laughs> Sorry to tip the hat. <laughs> Rules for living of Proverbs versus things that are beyond our control. Um, there are things that we can control. We can do the right thing. We can live the way that we understand is correct and not live the way that we understand is incorrect or unwise. Um, but regardless of what we do, there are things that are beyond our control. And that is part of what we find in Scripture, how to deal with that. Um, another example is the role of priests in the Old Testament it was kind of a static set thing. And it was understood, especially by Israel. Um, the priesthood of believers, when the veil was torn and Jesus' sacrifice ushered us into a new new era of how we can approach God. Um, that's another contrast that Old and New Testament, if we, under, if we study only one of those sides and not the other, we wouldn't have a very complete picture of everything that God's been doing through history. And then about poetry. Um, which all of these things that we're looking at today are in poetic form. It can communicate some things that narrative can't do so easily. Rhythm and cadence and flow and timing. Sometimes brevity, sometimes poetry is very long. Um, it's more, it tends to be more generic, general than specific. It's often timeless. It uses metaphor and simile and association. It has a structure to it that can be really helpful. And it invites our imagination in a way that narrative obviously does as well, but in a different way. Um, so let's dive in to Song of Songs. It's poetry of love, sensuality, sexuality, pursuit, and pleasure. How many of you ever have ever read all of Song of Songs? So about half of us. Um, it's not a go-to book necessarily, but it depends on what you're looking for. I, um, I love that this is in the Bible. And I think you can imagine that if there were different committees, that it, like if the Council of Nicaea was deciding what should be in between these covers, today certain groups would be like, I don't think that should be in the Bible, right? Um, it, it is part of human, of how we're created by God. It's part of, it's a very real part of our who we are and how we're wired, and it's beautiful, it's a gift. Is it allegory? It might be an allegory about God and Israel. It might be an allegory about Christ and the church. And both of those have valid points of view. But it might also primarily be, taken at face value, a celebration of love and desire and sexuality. Okay? So we're gonna watch a video. The Song of Songs. It's a well-known but not so well understood book of the Bible. It's eight chapters of love poetry. And while there is an introduction and a conclusion, the book doesn't have any kind of rigid literary design. And that's because it's a collection of poems. They're not meant to be dissected or taken apart. They're meant to be read as a flowing whole and simply enjoyed. The first line of the book tells us that it's the Song of Songs, which is a Hebrew idiom, like the Holy of Holies or the King of Kings. It's a Hebrew way of saying the greatest thing. So this is the greatest song of all songs. Then we're told in the first line that this Song of Songs is of Solomon. Which could mean that he is the author, his name does begin the book after all. But as you read the poems, you discover that the main voice is that of a woman called the Beloved. And while there is also a male voice, it does not seem to be Solomon's. Solomon is mentioned a couple times in the poems, but he's never a speaker. And you do have to admit, Solomon is a very odd candidate as the author of this book, given the fact that he has 700 
wives. For the lovers in the Song of Songs, they are the only ones in the world for each other. So the of Solomon likely means in the wisdom tradition of Solomon. He was known for his wisdom, his poetry, his love of learning about every part of life. And Solomon became the father of wisdom literature in Israel. And so his legacy is here carried on through a collection of love poems that explores the human experience of love and sexual desire. The opening poem introduces us to the basic theme of this book. We hear the voice of the young woman who delights in her man, a shepherd. Now, she's not married to him yet, but it becomes clear that they're engaged and they cannot wait to be together. From the introduction, the poems flow back and forth from the woman's voice to the man's, shifting from scene to scene without any kind of clear linear sequence or storyline. The poems move in these symphonic cycles and key images and ideas get repeated and developed. So, one of the basic themes uniting the poems is the intense desire that this couple has for each other, expressed through their constant seeking and finding. So, after the opening poem, they're separated but on the hunt for one another. So the woman calls out or she'll wake up from a dream or go looking for her lover and more than once they'll find each other, they'll embrace and then right when things start to get a bit racy, the scene will suddenly end and a new one will start, they're separated looking for each other and on it goes. Another repeated theme is the joy of the couple's physical attraction for one another. So multiple times they'll pause and describe each other with these elaborate metaphors. And here it's very helpful to know that these images and metaphors in Hebrew poetry are not primarily visual. If you try and paint a picture of these people based on them, <laughs> that is something that looks very, very strange. What you're supposed to do is reflect on the meaning of these images as they relate to the man and the woman. So you'll read through the poetic cycles, and the tension will keep building in their desire and joy and attraction. And this spiraling repetition is a poetic way of heightening and focusing on the mystery and power of sexual love. It all comes together in the conclusion, which pauses to summarize what these poems are all about. Love is as strong as death. Its passions are as severe as the grave. Its flashes are of fire, a divine flame. Many waters cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house or love, he would be utterly scorned. The poem highlights the power and the intensity of love, how it's both beautiful but also dangerous. Like fire, love can destroy people if it's abused or be life-giving if it's protected. Ultimately, love expresses the insatiable human longing to know and be fully known and desired by another. Love is one of the most transcendent and mysterious experiences in human life, and as a part of the Bible's wisdom tradition, this book says it's a gift from God. After this, there's an odd poem about Solomon trying to do what the previous poem just said was impossible, to buy love. The woman rejects Solomon's offer, and then the book concludes with the man and the woman, they're separate once more on the hunt for each other. He calls to hear her voice, she begs him to run away with her, and that's how the book ends. It's totally open-ended. But that's a lot like love, which never truly concludes, because there's always more to discover and pursue in your beloved. And so true love has no end, and neither does this book. Now through history, the big question raised by the Song of Songs is, what on earth is love poetry doing in the Bible? There have been three main interpretations of this book throughout history. In Jewish tradition, it's been read as an allegory, each character a symbol. So the woman is Israel, the man is God, and their love is a symbol of the covenant between God and Israel made at Mount Sinai and giving of the Torah. This view flowed into the Christian tradition, but the characters were swapped. So it's about Christ's love for his people, the church. And this interpretation was inspired by Paul's words in Ephesians 5, that a Christian husband's love for his wife is a symbol of Christ's love for the church. What's interesting is that in the last hundred years, archaeological discoveries among Israel's ancient neighbors in Egypt and Babylon has turned up all kinds of ancient love poetry that's very similar in language and imagery to the Song of Songs. We see that love poetry was a meaningful part of Israel's cultural environment, which has led most scholars today to view the Song of Songs as what it presents itself to be, an arrangement of Israelite love poetry reflecting on the divine gift of love. But that doesn't mean that it's only ancient love poetry. There's a key feature of these poems that sticks out when you read them as a part of the Old Testament. 
And that's the overwhelming use of garden imagery. There are powerful echoes of the Garden of Eden and the idyllic scene between the married couple in the early chapters of Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman naked and vulnerable, but completely unified and safe with one another, this resonates in the background of the Song of Songs. It's as if in these poems we are witnessing the love of a couple whose relationship is untainted by selfishness and sin. And so ultimately the song holds out hope that even though our own relationships are so often distorted by selfishness, love is a transcendent gift. And it's meant to point us to something greater, to the gift of God's love that will one day permeate and transform his beloved world. And that's what the Song of Songs is all about. All right. Once I saw that image, it's just like, it's in my head. <laughs> um, just a reminder, there are videos like this. These are called overview videos on the BibleProject.com. And there are videos for every book of the Bible, and then there are a bunch of other videos. The next two videos we look at today are newer versions that aren't, there are overview versions for the two other books we're talking about today. <coughs> so you can always find this style of illustration and in-depth sort of what's the structure, what are the themes, what's the content, who's writing this, when. Um, so we won't look at the other two versions that are available for the books we're covering today, but they're on the website if you want to do that. So Proverbs, we're going to keep moving. Um, I call it wise and otherwise sayings, and you'll get an idea what I mean by that. Um, if we look at, you know, where is wisdom in the hierarchy of all these different things that have to do with knowing something, learning something, understanding, discerning. Um, I would say at the bottom is information. If you do a Google search on something, you get some information. If you look at multiple results, and sort of start to, to read and take in, you start to have some knowledge about that topic, even if it's a brand new topic you didn't know about. And if you, over time, have conversations and keep on learning and learning other facets of that topic, you start to gain understanding. And it's not like these are exactly in this order, or there's not overlap, and they're not you know A, then B, then C, then D. Um, but Insight is a little bit more like if someone has insight about a medical topic, they don't they haven't just like read the Wikipedia page. They actually have some insight about what are some choices here and what's this gonna do and what does this mean for this person who wants to make good choices about their health. Um, as another level from that is discernment. And discernment and wisdom might be parallel words, but um, they have to do with not just having information and not just having knowledge and not just actually understanding it but being able to use it to advise and make decisions and consider things in a much more complicated way there's a hebrew word chokhmah which is the word that's used for this um, and there's the video that we look at will we'll have a little bit more to say about um, what's in, how that's a parallel thing to the way god actually creates and works and lives it's not just the head thing um, and it has to also do with skill and action. Does anyone here today lack wisdom? <laughs> I lack wisdom. Um, there's a great verse in James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, we could just take a few seconds now and pray and then go, do I feel any different or do I have more wisdom? It's not an instantaneous thing, right? But the, the idea behind this is if we lack wisdom, which is going to always be the case um, in our lives in various ways, even if we gain some wisdom, there are other areas that we need more wisdom, God is willing to, it seems to be part of who we're created to be, how God behaves and how we're made in God's image, is to exercise wisdom as we create, as we live, as we love. So Solomon had 700 wise, but he's considered very, very wise. <laughs> um, so no one has complete wisdom, and wisdom isn't this sort of, once you get your high school diploma, you always have it, right? Um, there might be other areas in life where you've had wisdom, you've gained wisdom, you've acquired it, you've really developed a much deeper level than having information or understanding. Um, and yet you can stumble into some other part of life and act you know, in a way that's very foolish and, and has no wisdom at all. 
There's quite a few times in, in Proverbs that talk about the fear of the Lord. One of them is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And it's not sort of being afraid of God, but it's a healthy respect for God and for what God's intent is and how God wants us to live. There's a very similar verse a few chapters later. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So these words that were on that sort of pyramid diagram I had are being used throughout Proverbs and throughout other parts of Scripture. And I think it's really interesting that it uses the phrase the beginning of. So it's not just fear the Lord and you'll have wisdom. It's this, it's this iterative, ongoing process and the beginning step is just to fear the Lord. Um, I think it's possible for people to have wisdom who don't fear the Lord, but probably not complete. We can't, it's not like mathematical where we can say, if you don't fear the Lord, there's no way you'll have wisdom. Because there are people who don't fear the Lord. Um, and I would just say that the wisdom in their lives is incomplete from what God designed and intended and created. And as we read the Proverbs, it, a lot of times there's like, if you're, you know, do this and be righteous, don't do this and because that's wicked. Um, and so there's these columns, and a lot of times it's a parallel structure in the pairs and the couplets of the poetry. Um, be righteous, don't be wicked. And so it's easy for us to think, oh yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like those wicked people. Um, and if we sort of back off from that a little bit, we can realize that we're actually on both sides of this column. It's not always the people, um, it's not always obvious that it's the others who are wicked and we're good because we've been trying to live good. Who can say, I have kept my heart pure and I'm clean without sin? Nobody can say that. Here's another video. There are three books in the Bible that have come to be called the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And all these books are addressing the same set of questions. What kind of world are we living in? And what does it look like to live well in this world? So, how to be good at life? Yeah. So each of these books tackles these questions from a unique perspective. And it's important to understand all of them to get a fully biblical perspective on the good life. So, as a thought experiment, you could actually imagine each of these books as a person. So Proverbs would be like this brilliant young teacher, and Ecclesiastes is the sharp, middle-aged critic. And Job would be this weathered old man who's seen a lot in his day. We're going to start by meeting the book of Proverbs, the brilliant young teacher. And she's not just smart, she's smart about everything. Work, relationships, sex, spirituality. She has incredible insights, things you wouldn't see in her own. Yeah, she would be the perfect friend to have around when you need really specific advice. So what makes her so smart? Well, Proverbs can see things that most people don't see. She believes that there's an invisible creative force in the universe that can guide people in how they should live. And you can't see it, just like you can't see gravity, but it affects everything that we do. So what's this force? Well, in Hebrew, it's called chokhmah, and it usually gets translated into English as wisdom. It's an attribute of God that God used to create the world. And chokhmah has been woven into the fabric of things and how they work. So wherever people are making good or just or wise decisions, they're tapping into chokhmah. And whenever someone's making a bad decision, they're working against chokhmah. Right, or as it says in Proverbs chapter 1, the waywardness of fools will destroy them. But the one who listens to wisdom lives in security. So it's like a moral law of the universe. Yeah, it's a cause-effect pattern that no one can escape. And Proverbs personifies all of this as a woman. Yeah, Lady Wisdom. Right, and she roams around the earth calling out and making herself available to anyone who's willing to listen to her and to learn. Which leads to the second thing Proverbs believes, that anyone can access and interact with wisdom and use it to make a beautiful life for yourself or for others. You can create with it like a designer. Yes, in fact, chokhmah in Hebrew isn't simply intellectual knowledge. The word is also used to describe a skilled artisan who excels at their craft, like woodworking or stonemasoning. So you show you possess Pokemon when you put it to work and develop the skill of making a good life. Okay, that makes sense. So let's do this. Let's go find some wisdom. But before you do, Proverbs has one more really important thing to consider. Pokemon isn't some impersonal force. 
It's an attribute of God himself. And so in Hebrew thought, your journey to becoming wise has to begin with what Proverbs calls the fear of the Lord. It's this healthy respect for God's definition of good and evil. And true wisdom means learning those boundary lines and not crossing them. Now, all those ideas you just unpacked are in chapters 1 through 9 in Proverbs. But when I think of the book of Proverbs, I think of the collection of sayings, the Proverbs themselves. Tell me about those. Yeah, those are what you find in chapters 10 on to the end of the book. It's a collection of hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs about any and all aspects of life. And Hokma gets applied to them, resulting in this wise guidance to help you find a path towards success, no matter what you do. If I design my life with these sayings, life is going to be good. Yeah, or as Proverbs puts it, it'll give health to your bones, prosperity, a long, rich life. Which is a really big claim. But you can see, it's often the case. Wise people, they tend to do better. Things usually work out well for them in life. And so that is the promise and the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is really beautiful. But if we take a step back, some people would argue it's a little too simplistic. Because sometimes horrible things happen to really wise people, and sometimes foolish people get rewarded. It doesn't always work the way we think it should work. That's right. Which is why we need to go and listen to our next wise friend, Ecclesiastes the Critic. Because he's wrestled with that very problem, and he's going to push us further in our journey to find the good life. So staying in Proverbs for a little while, and we'll look at a number of specific Proverbs. Um, there's this structure and format that varies sometimes within the same chapter. There's multiple different ones. Different parts of statements that are usually in two parts. A, therefore B, or A and B. A, however, B. Um, just as A, so B. So I won't read all of these, but that structure is pretty varied, and it varies even verse to verse sometimes. Um, and it's helpful to just notice that. You can see it right in the language. Um, there's also... Um, I listened this week to the Proverbs on Bible Gateway and there's different voices you can choose and one is called something drama and it's dramatic reading and it's and I did that with song 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 songs too and it's like I would say it's not the world's you know highest form of drama in terms of <laughs> skill but it is interesting to hear different voices male and female voices and it's just a different way than when you're reading it on the page and it can be just kind of dry and sort of removed from human context and voice. Proverbs are probabilities, but they're not um, always guaranteed outcomes. If you do such and such, we'll look at a couple of examples. If you do such and such, you'll just live a long time. That doesn't always happen, okay? It doesn't mean there's no wisdom there. And it doesn't mean that that's a likely thing. If you follow this advice, and maybe you should follow the advice anyway, regardless of how long your life is going to be. Um, and some of these seem like these are always true, these always apply across any culture, across any time. Sometimes it's like, well, that's often true, but there's exceptions. Sometimes it's occasionally true, sometimes it's culturally and linguistically bound, and sometimes it's not universally true necessarily. Okay? So, rich and poor have this in common, the Lord is the maker of them all. I would say that's always true. I'm not trying to get us to evaluate every thing in Proverbs and say that's true or false or whatever, but just there's, there's these sort of different territories. Um, the poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. And because of this poetry, it's not necessarily talking about specifically eyesight. It might also be talking about perception, right? So there's different ways to understand what's actually being meant and intended by the person that came up with these sayings. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Hmm. It's interesting that in Proverbs, there are no references that I found to nagging husbands. I think they existed. Or men as the sort of initiators of adultery. Um, so culture bound, but some of those attitudes would exist today if people would write these same kinds of things. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. <laughs> Sounds pretty harsh. Three verses later, it says, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. So we need to see the context of other things, even within the same passage, just a few verses apart. 
<clears throat> one who oppresses the poor to increase his wealth, and one who gives gifts to the rich, both come to poverty. <clears throat> I'm going to skip through a couple of these because of time. Blows and wounds scrub away evil, and beatings purge the inmost being. I don't know. Like, I'd like to discuss that and understand the context, but sometimes there are different perspectives on collective wisdom that change over time, and we would say those changes are good. Our perspectives on slavery, for example. Um, so this is all in this book, Proverbs. Maybe some advice for social media. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth. An outsider and not your own lips. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Or so others reflect your heart back to you. So we're going to have to jump to Ecclesiastes. And we're not going to look at the video. Um, actually, how much time is it? It's 10.52. 10.52. I think we will look at the video and that will be at time. Be the end. Okay. Okay. We're exploring three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Joseph. And they're all asking the question, what does it mean to live well in this world? So we've looked at Proverbs, who you could think of as a bright young teacher. She's all about pursuing wisdom, an attribute of God that's woven into reality. And she's optimistic that if you use wisdom, you will build a successful life. But then we come to Ecclesiastes, who's more like this sharp middle-aged critic. And he says, you think using wisdom will bring you success. You better think again, because life here under the sun is meaningless. And that's a phrase he uses a lot in this book. But to understand this book, we have to realize first that we're hearing two voices. So first there's the teacher, and we've been calling him the critic. He's the main voice in the book. But he is introduced to us by another figure, the author. And he's the one who's collected the critic's words, and then at the end of the book summarizes everything and gets the final word. So why does the author want us to hear from the critic? Well, he wants to turn your view of the world upside down, and he's going to let the critic explore three really disturbing things about the world. And we should warn you, these are pretty intense. Yeah, so the first is the march of time, or as the critic says, Generations come and generations go, but the earth, it's been here long before us, and will be long after. No one remembers people from long ago, and all the people yet to come, they too will be forgotten by those who come after them. And so, on a cosmic scale, you and I, we are just a blur. Stars are born, and then they die and form planets which orbit new stars, and those planets, they change over time, and eventually they die. And amidst this cosmic backdrop, my entire existence is like a blink in time. Which leads to the critic's second disturbing observation, that we are all going to die. Humans face the same fate as the animals. Death. All people, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, those who offer sacrifices to God and those who do not, they all share the same destiny. All this activity and madness, then we all join the dead. Man, this book is depressing. And so <laughs> the final disturbing thing for the critic, and that is life's random nature. So in Proverbs, life is not random. There's a clear cause and effect relationship between doing the right thing and being rewarded. But the fact is that life doesn't always work that way. The critic has observed a glitch in the system. He calls it chance, or in his words, The race doesn't always go to the swift, or to battle to the strong. Nor does food always come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the educated. Time and chance happen to them all. So his point is that you can't really control anything in life. It's just way too unpredictable. So if I want to master life, then you're setting yourself up for the fall. Now throughout the book, the critic uses a metaphor to tie together all of these disturbing ideas. Nearly 40 times he says that everything in life is hell. It's a Hebrew word that means smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life is beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape, and before you know it, 
it takes a new shape. And smoke looks solid, but try and grab it, it'll slip right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, it's impossible to see clearly. Now our modern translations have lost the metaphor, and they usually translate pebble as meaningless. But if you read closely, the critic isn't saying that life has no meaning, but rather that its meaning is never clear. Like smoke, life is confusing, it's disorienting and uncontrollable. So, what are we supposed to do with all of it? Well, surprisingly, the critic first of all acknowledges the perspective of the Proverbs. He says, it's a really good idea to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. Really? I mean, he just said that doesn't guarantee success. But he knows it's the right thing to do. But secondly, and more often, he says that since you can't control your life, you should stop trying. Learn to hold things with an open hand, because you really only have control over one thing, and that's your attitude towards the present moment. Stop worrying, he says, and choose to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, or the sun on your face, or a good meal with people that you care about. The simple things in life. Yes, and both the good things and the bad, because both are rich gifts from God. And that's the surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Listening to the critic is painful and can lead you into some dark places. And that's why the author speaks up at the end of the book. He doesn't want you to lose hope, he wants to make you humble. Into someone who trusts that life has meaning even when you can't make sense of it. That one day God will clear the hell and bring his justice on all that we've done. And so he tells us that the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Now there's one more voice in the Bible's wisdom literature, and that's the book of Job. And he will be... And that we'll do in two weeks. That's it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Barry. That was very helpful. Um, pray with me, and then we will dismiss to go to second service. God, thanks so much for speaking to us through your word, through the people who wrote that word, and through the people today who are reading that word. Thanks for Mary and the wisdom that you have provided him in sharing this with us. And God, help us to see the, the ways that you are working and being and um, loving us through the smoke, through the heaven. Um, help us to see that and to be wise and to be open to that wisdom for us. Go with us today. In your name we pray. Amen. And please join us next week for Jonah, and then we'll come back to Job and more wisdom later on. Let me just say that Jonah only has four little chapters, so you might want to take one a day and just ask, what do you learn about Jonah and what do you learn about God? It's a fun book. Thank you. <laughs>